Welcome to the In His Grip podcast with Dr. Chuck F. Betters, produced by Mark Inc. Ministries. Let's join Dr. Betters in the sanctuary as he preaches the series, Building a Spiritual Legacy. Rest from the indecision and uncertainty that we face every day can be ours when we're indecisive about the moral choices we have to make. Which way do I go? What do I do when I'm faced with this? Where do I go? Do I turn right? Do I turn left? Do I stand pat? What do I do? Every day, there's indecision. And yet in Christ, there is rest. Why should we be at rest? If you'll look at Psalm 116, and you'll look with me at verse 7b, we'll start there. Why should I be at rest? Why should I have a thankful heart? Why should I not have a presumptuous spirit? Why? For the Lord has been good to you. For you, O Lord, have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Listen to me. God has purposed your rest, and God has purchased the rest that he purposed. Why? Because God promised you this rest. Therefore, each day of my life, I must choose that rest. God purposed it. God promised it. Christ purchased it. I must choose it. Every day of my life as a Christian, I can choose to be presumptuous or I can choose to be thankful and to be at rest. Now let's look at the therefore. If all of this is true, since all of this is true, therefore, that's what he begins verse 9 with, that, all of this is true, that. You see what he's going to say the rest of this, in the rest of this passage is if God's grace is the stimulant that brings you the rest and the thankful heart that does not presume upon the grace of God, then that grace must move to action. That grace must become active. Otherwise, it's presumptuous. It's presumptuous living. Grace must always be motivated to action. He says, all of this is true. I have that rest. I have that thankful heart. God has delivered me from death's door itself. I have the peace and the joy of knowing my God in this kind of intimate way so that, verse 9, I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Some translators say that that word may is will. Uh, I don't think it really matters. That the land of the living is the sons of men. That the land of the living is the kingdom of heaven. I don't think it really matters because as far as God is concerned, the kingdom of heaven that he has in glory has already begun here among the sons of men. So he's telling us, I must now live out this forgotten principle. Let me ask you a question. Are you an Orpah or a Ruth? You know that wonderful story of the book of Ruth? Are you an Orpah or a Ruth? Let me see if I can explain that to you. There's a forgotten principle. We are spectacles before the angels. And if we are spectacles before created angels, how much more are we spectacles before the God who fashioned us and has been so good to us? We are spectacles before God. Our thoughts, our speech, our actions go unhidden from him. Living in the context of gratitude before a God who has been so good to us. You know the lame man at the gate in the book of Acts right after Pentecost? Peter and John walk up to him. They see him sitting there. 
Everybody else, all the religious people for years just walked by this guy, threw in their coins, threw in their little change. And uh, by the way, they would do so with ostentatious spirits as well. They would actually stop at the guy that's sitting there, at the uh, the lame guy sitting at the gate. They would stop and they would hold up their money. Everybody else would stop and watch. Watch what I'm doing. Cling. And they'd walk right by him. So when the man asked him for silver or gold, when he asked him for money, what did Peter and John say? They stopped too. Everybody else stopped to look to see what Peter and John were going to do for this lame man. He said, I don't have any silver or gold. But what I do have, I'm going to give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And you know what he did? He got up and he walked, but he did more. The Bible tells us he began to leap and jump and praise God. He gave glory to God. You see what I'm talking about here? To walk before the Lord means that we walk as children in the context of a heavenly father. To be seen by a holy God who knows even from birth, even before birth, our name, the hairs on our head, the cups of sorrow we will have to drink, the pain our body will bear, the self-doubt, the confusion. And the promise here is, so that I will walk before the Lord, giving glory to God. Continuous verb, by the way, which means it's not something you do just one time. You don't just walk before the Lord one time. You walk before the Lord every day, every second, again and again and again. It's a continuous loop. It never ends. That verb means every second of my life. That's why the hymn writer says, I need thee every hour. Another hymn writer says, it's Not every hour, it's moment by moment. That's what it means to walk before God. Continuous verb. But now I asked you, are you an Orpah? Or are you a Ruth? Naomi lost her husband. She was now a widow. She had two sons who married Moabite women. And the two sons died. Now she's not only had the drink of the cup of sorrow once, but three times. Here is a woman with two other women, two daughters-in-law. Can you imagine the terror? No, you can't, because in that world, women living by themselves with no one else to care for them, no male heir, those women were in terrible, terrible danger. And so they heard in the midst of the famine they were experiencing that there was food to be found. But they had to pack their bags and leave home. So the stage is set to answer the question, are you an Orpah, one of the daughters-in-law, or are you a Ruth, the other daughter-in-law? If you want to turn to it, you can. If not, just listen to me. In the book of Ruth, chapter 1, we read this beginning with verse 10. We will go back with you to your people. That's what the daughters-in-law said to Naomi. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. And even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. At this, they wept again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung to her. 
Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and to her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn my back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me ever so severely if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Are you an Orpah? Or are you a Ruth? Parenthetically, the book of Ruth is in the Bible to show us the lineage of King David. The whole purpose of the book of Ruth is to point us back to the grandparents that came as the result of the union between Ruth and Boaz because Ruth clung tenaciously to her mother-in-law and to her mother-in-law's God. Will you be an Orpah and turn back or will you be a Ruth and cling to your God? So I ask a question. What is your selling price? What is your selling price? So typical of kids, teenagers, by the way, who take a step or two with Jesus. Maybe they go on a retreat or are moved by a certain moment. Emotionally, they're charged and now they're walking with Jesus. They take a step or two forward but when the heat gets turned up, as it was with these two women, with nothing to live for but an unsafe place and possible starvation, they quickly cave, just like their parents, who quickly cave. You see, faith without works is dead. Verse 10 says, I believed Therefore, I said, I am greatly afflicted. And in my dismay, I said, all men are liars. Notice what the psalmist says. I believed. Then I said. Say, what are you talking about? Here's what I'm talking about. If my heart has never been changed by the blood of Christ then my heart remains the same in its fallen nature, condemned by a holy God who hates sin. If I have never ever trusted Christ as my Savior and Lord, I'm the same man today that I was when I was born. Nothing's changed, nothing's different. But if I truly have come to experience his love and his forgiveness by his grace, not by what I've done, but by his grace, if my heart truly has been the recipient of, the, of that kind of divine favor, then and only then do I have the right to speak. That's what the psalmist said, I believe, therefore I said. But now we raise this question. If you have no faith, do you really have anything to share? Oh, you may have a few words of wisdom about life in this world. You may have a good business plan. You may have some wisdom as far as your job's concerned. But as far as affecting people's lives and as far as affecting your own life, if you have no faith in Christ, you have nothing to share. There is absolutely nothing to share. You have no reason to open your mouth. Not to your kids, not to your church, not to your community. Oh, you can give them some kind of moral guidance and what have you. You can be a father, you can be a mother, you can do all those things, but you will never ever build the kingdom of God apart from faith in Jesus Christ. I believed, therefore I speak. Now, if your life 
is inconsistent, your words are meaningless. Your kids, your kids are surrounding themselves with anonymity. Here's what I mean. As long as we are in social relationships, as long as I am face to face with somebody, I have certain moral inhibitions and moral choices and moral restrictions because I'm face to face with that person. You set me around 10 or 15 people, I'm going to make certain moral choices as the result of being around 15 or 20 people. But if I can move into anonymity, if I can move into a secret life, then I can be whatever I feel like being and nobody will know the difference. And the more we become a culture of anonymity, the easier it's going to be for me to lower those moral inhibitions and to become something that I'm not or something that I wish I could be. Now, you men, listen to me. You can have an affair and your wife will never know it. You can have an affair with a faceless woman and your wife will never know it. You can have an affair every day of your life. Now, listen to me. 90% of you or more are struggling with this and you know it. You can turn next door to your wife and say, no, I'm not struggling with that, but you're lying. You are struggling with that. And by the way, it's not just men. It's women. And all of that anonymity, all of that moral inhibition that is being dismantled, all of that moral integrity that dissolves in our anonymity is being passed on to our children. Your children, your children, have created home pages for themselves. Many of them are innocuous. In fact, most of them are innocuous. There are a few of them that, frankly, are very disappointing to me to see. And if you click on their web page, their home page, on these places that have been created just for this reason, by the way, 50, 60, 40, 50, 60 year old men are posturing themselves as 14 and 15 year old teenagers, and your kids are subjecting themselves to that. It's been all over the news. It's not just the church now, it's all over the news. Secular media is picking up on the dangers your kids are experiencing. Well, I went to visit some of these websites. Thank you for listening. For the complete sermon, please visit markinc.org and click In His Grip. Join Dr. Chuck F. Betters in the sanctuary from Monday to Friday on the In His Grip podcast.